You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we are live, but we got to let the stream breathe just for a few seconds. You know the drill. And we're good. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. And with me, as always, my partner in crime, my fellow football priest, you know him, you love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, after many months of wondering, many months of waiting, Logan Ryan finally found a new NFL home. He is officially off the board and was signed by the New York Giants today, which means that, you know, Broncos fans can kind of take him off the, the wish list, as it were. For $7.5 I think it was, a one-year deal. And you know what? For a guy who can play safety, play cornerback, is still very much a playmaker at this point in his career, um, that's actually a good value for the Giants. I never thought he'd be an option for the Broncos, simply because they can't allocate so much money to one spot in the secondary. Justin Simmons still being unpaid, yada, yada, yada. Although, maybe not Logan Ryan, but who was released today, Chad, was mm-hmm. Prince Mukamar by the Raiders. He's back on the open market now, and I, for one, would be much more inclined to pay him some money to shore up that secondary. A lot of Broncos fans came at me on Twitter because I suggested that, and they said, we don't need cornerback depth. We're, we're good there. We're solid there. How? You're two bad snaps away from having Isaac Yadam starting in the second. It's terrifying to me why you wouldn't want more veteran depth back there behind Bosby and Callahan, both coming off injuries, and uh, Ojemudia, a rookie. Why wouldn't you want to have another veteran in there? I, I just know to Logan Ryan it was never going to happen, but now that Amukamara is on the open market for – and what would he sign for now? Maybe two, three million a year, got cut by the Raiders. He would take the veteran minimum right now. Right. So to, to shell that money, bring him in the secondary, reunite him with Vic Fangio at Donatel, that's a no-brainer to me, Chad. It always was. I was going to say that, you know, unless something, nothing's probably changed for the Broncos in terms of there was a reason why they didn't sign Prince of Mukamara. They had plenty of opportunity, but something changed in the equation. And that is not only the fact that he's now a free agent, but also that he might be a little bit more desperate as it were, not so much desperate, but maybe more likely to take a low ball type of offer because the Broncos do have plans. Look, there's a lot of unproven – the depth behind Bouye, A.J. Bouye, and Bryce Callahan is completely unproven, but the Broncos are excited about their young guys. However, as Zach just intimated, once you get past Devontae Bosby, who is cruising for that number three corner slot, the, Who's the, left? there's no proven anything. There's So they like him, but in terms of proven commodity, you're, you got to be a little bit worried. So I could see the Broncos – maybe bringing him in if he's willing to take close to, if not the veteran minimum. But it really just depends on how desperate Prince is and if that's even an option. Because, you know, from what I've been told, the the Broncos are have been pleased with what they've seen for the most part from these young guys behind Callahan and Bouye. You, you know what? I, I understand that the Broncos not signing him to begin with. If they didn't want him then, they're probably not going to want him now. And who knows him better, Amukamara, than Fangio and Donatel. But to say that he wouldn't help out the secondary and to say the Broncos shouldn't sign him because he was just released by the Raiders, by using that logic, Chad, you shouldn't have signed Demar Dotson, you shouldn't have signed Melvin Gordon, you shouldn't have signed Glasgow, you shouldn't have signed any free agent. I don't care when they become available. Look at Evan Mathis a few years ago. He was released in the summer. He turned out to be a great pickup. I mean, look at Demar Dotson now. Half of us want him to start right away. He's not going to be a starter in Mukamar. He's not going to be a cornerback one. He won't even be a cornerback two. But as a depth piece, as an insurance policy, as a mentor for the locker room, as someone who can come in from day one and who knows the playbook in Fangio's system, it's a no doubt, no brainer kind of move. I don't, I, I doubt it's going to happen because, like I said, if they wanted him, they would have signed him already. But to me, I mean, shell out a couple million bucks to give yourself some, some peace of mind in a very important spot on that defense. And to my knowledge, we still don't know the details of the one-year deal that Mark Barron signed with the Broncos. So, but even, you know, maybe two, three million tops with incentives, right? I'm sure it's another highly incentive-laden deal similar to the one Dotson got, which was three million in total value if he hits every single escalator with only 400K guaranteed. 
I would guess that that Barron's deal is somewhere close to that, which means that the Broncos still have some some you know flexibility with regard to the salary cap. Doesn't yeah. mean they'll use it because of these uncertain times. They're not sure what revenue is going to be, and they don't know what the cap's going to look like, and all that stuff. We've talked about this horse we flogged over and over again, but you know, again, when it comes to that cornerback position, you got two guys at the top who have looked good in camp. Look, Bouye's look good. Callahan's look good. But they're both guys who have an injury history. Bouye, one of the reasons why he has kind of lost some of his luster, or I should say lost some of his luster in Jacksonville, Zach, is the injury bug. And then we all know Bryce Callahan is still yet to play a full 16-game season, and he's entering his sixth year in the NFL. Mm. So good point. Fail safe. You need a fail safe. I like Devontae Bosby. We both do. I think uh, it's safe to say Zach and I are probably a lot more high, a lot higher, I should say, on on uh, Bosby than a lot of people out there. But once you get past him, look, Ojemudi is going to take time to marinate. He can't even get on the field with that quad. Um, you know, he's they've well, they're working it back in. He's working with trainers. But in terms of that immediate impact that he maybe could have made. As a rookie, it's going to be delayed way out into the season because of that quad. You know, Devontae Harris? That's exactly right as well. He's not ready to be thrown in yet. He's not ready to be given significant snaps. He's not that. He's not there yet. Why rush another project? Why have another Langley or Yadam on your hands? Take your time, invest in the secondary, get a Mukamara in the building, and allow the young players – to, to meet chat, Duke Dawson, Devontae Harris, uh, you know, Isaac Adam, they're less than Jags to me. I, I would not uh, not upgrade that spot because they're there. They're not going to prevent me from signing a Mukamara because they might have upside. They haven't shown anything. Devontae Harris got juked out of his cleats by K.J. Hamler in training camp. He showed me nothing. Duke Dawson last year showed me nothing. We all know about Isaac Adam. I, I just still I, I bang the table for vet, veteran depth in that secondary the same way we bang in the table for the offensive line. They placated the O-line with, with the tackle with Dotson. Why not do the same thing in the secondary? For a guy like Vic Fangio, Chad, it's mind-boggling they're letting it just lapse for young players. You know, maybe there's just something Fangio knows about Prince that we maybe. don't know. Got some insight. As we've said a couple of times already tonight, there's a reason why the Broncos didn't move on him earlier in the free agent uh, window. And we're just going to have to see how it shakes out. I would, you know, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. What that means is it's unlikely the Broncos are suddenly going to go after Prince of Mukamara because they have their reasons, but don't completely eliminate it as a possibility. And especially with Ojemudi being banged up and Duke Dawson has not had a good camp. In fact, I think Duke Dawson doesn't even make this team yeah. and that's not too surprising considering he was a waiver claim or no, excuse me, trade, right? He was a trade last year on the doorstep of the season uh, from, from new England. So they did give up some draft capital and he does have a second round draft pedigree from the Patriots, but he has been, I mean, not, he's shown us nothing similar to Justin Hollins as an off ball linebacker. <laughs> he's shown us nothing. And in fact, every time he was on the field last year, Duke Dawson, he was more of a liability than anything. And Zach, we got, of course, a lot to get to tonight. We want to talk about the fact that, DeMar Dotson received some first-team reps today. How did it go? What's the dynamic between he and Elijah Wilkinson? How is this right tackle position going to shape up? We're going to get to that here in just a second. But first, we got to go through some quick matters of business. Gang, make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. While you're at it, follow the main account as well, at uh, Mile High Huddle. You get those two checked. You're going to make sure you don't miss anything as it relates to the podcast or breaking Broncos news and analysis. And gang, gentle reminder, head on over to huddleuppod.com, get your swag on, get yourself one of these football priest hats, one of these football priest t-shirts. You got the best seller of the last month is Zach's Let Him Hate shirt. Also, Zachary Smouse's Let Him Hate shirt, Mile High Huddle Let Him Hate. A lot of stuff, beanies, masks, um, mugs, hoodies, a little something for everybody. It's just another way that you can support what we are doing here at Mile High Huddle. And if you're not in a position to do that, it's all good. These three things really help us out. And each one of you, whether you're with us live or after the fact, listening as a podcast on demand, all three of these things you can do. Subscribe, like, share. If you really love what we're doing here, help us with those three things. And MHH will continue to grow and reach like-minded Broncos fans just like you. And then one last thing, gang, we want to give a shout out here to our Facebook supporters. 
we added a new one and I'm sorry that uh, I wasn't able to get his name into the new, into this graphic before we went live, but we will shout you out my friend on Wednesday night. But as you can see, while the list is still sayable, I guess uh, on a broadcast like this, shout out to Bobby, Steve, Jerry, Michael, Emmy, Gerald, Chris, Roger, Jeff, Amber, and Christopher. Love you guys. Appreciate your support. And if you are one of our great members um, of the Facebook community we have at Mile High Huddle, check it out. That's a way you can support us if you are inclined to do so. And uh, as always, we certainly appreciate it. And I'll put the link real quick. Last thing, I'll put the link here in the chat stream. You guys can check that out if you're on Facebook when you get a second. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, Zach, before we dive into the meat and potatoes of tonight's show, I got to give a special, special shout out to one of our superstars. Everyone knows him. Everyone loves him. Glenn Hauser. Now, Glenn sent me a little something, Zach, and everybody knows I'm a big fan. My favorite band in the world all right, is Bad Religion. Melodic punk rock. That's my favorite band. Very smart. It's, it's always been uh, number one for me is Bad Religion. You guys have even heard me mention on this podcast that they just came out with a book on the band, telling the history of the band, and that I purchased it and that I'd already read it. Well, I came home today to a knock on the door, FedEx, okay? It's the book. And, you, and I thought, oh, that's really sweet, you know? You didn't have to do that. Brad, now I've got two copies, Zach. And then as I open it up, I literally get chills because there's this little certificate, Zach. And then as I lift it up, it's signed well, by the band. Okay. <laughs> that's that's so awesome. It was a, it is a very kingly gift. And Glenn, you, you, you blow me away with that generosity and it's really sweet. And I just wanted to give you a shout out and wow, say thanks. Cool. And it's just Zach, um, the, our, our community, it's, they continue to just surprise us at every turn, you know, sending us stuff uh, just with the support daily on the podcast and the streams yeah. and the articles, that's enough, but they go above and beyond Zach. They send us keepsakes. They send us gifts and it's just amazing. It's really touching. I mean, on the bookshelf behind me, I have the stuff that Stu sent me. I have the book that Duke sent me, the Elway book. I mean, Chad, it's so thoughtful. What a great gift, too. I mean, signed by the band, and it's your favorite band. It's yep. very, very – it's going above and beyond. We really do have the best fan base in the entire world, not just our pod, but Broncos country in general. I, we've said it before, and we'll say it again until the day we die, both of us, in real life, the best fans on the face of the earth in all of sports. And you know what? I was going to maybe wait because we're going to have Glenn on the show Wednesday night, but I was so excited and I know he was excited for it to get here. He was staying on top of that tracking number, making sure he got here. And uh, so I wanted to mention it. So thank you, Glenn. Much love to you, my friend. Really appreciate you. All right, Zach, we got to talk about the right tackle situation because as we talked about on last night's show, Saturday, Drew Locked and the offense did not have the best day. Took a little bit of a step backward. And a big reason for that was the constant pressure coming off the right side. The right tackle, Elijah Wilkinson, was a sieve. And frankly, Zach, it was nothing new. He's based, he's really struggled this entire camp. And, you know, it shouldn't be too surprising because we saw him start 12 games at right tackle last year and 10 sacks he relinquished. I don't, I can't recall off the top of my head exactly how many pressures, but it's a lot. Plus, he was penalized six times. We knew kind of what to expect, which is why we were pounding the table for them to sign someone. Well, they did. And they, after John James opted out, they went out and signed DeMar Dotson. And as the reality has sunk in increasingly day by day through camp that Wilkinson is just in over his head, we're thinking, all right, today's the day DeMar Dotson finally makes that that leap up the depth chart and get some first-team reps, and especially going on you know Monday, which was a – day after they, they had an off day, I thought this would be a time where we might see some changes, and we did. He did receive some reps. Even though he, uh, Elijah Wilkinson started out the day at right tackle with the ones, Zach played most of the of the reps, to be honest, with the ones. DeMar Dotson was worked into the first team toward the end of practice, and I reached out to a friend of Mile High Huddle, Cecil Lammy, who, of course, has the Nick and Cecil show on 104.3 The Fan each and every day, and I said, dude, you got to tell me how they look, what, how – you know, how many reps did Dotson get? What was the lay of the land? Zach, he said, he's the one that explained to me exactly how he got worked in the whole nine yards. Unfortunately, though, their main takeaway, he said they were both bad. They both weren't, neither one of them were good. Now, 
does that is the takeaway from that, Zach, that I guess there was a reason DeMar Dotson was sitting on the free agent market well into the period of time when training camps have started? Or is it simply a case of, you know, he goes from working with the threes to working with the twos to suddenly going against Von Miller and it's going to take a little getting used to. It's a case of it's one man's opinion that DeMar Dotson is, is struggling along with Elijah Wilkinson. I mean, I respect Cecil Lammy. He's there. He's been doing it. He's, he's an insider for the team. Uh, he knows what he's talking about, but it's one guy's opinion. He has a brain and eyes, and he has his own objective thoughts and opinions. I happen to think DeMar Dotson cannot be worse wholeheartedly than Elijah Wilkinson a tackle, if only because Dotson is a natural tackle. And if there is a second factor in play here, it's not so much going from third to first string. It's like you said, going against Von Miller, Going against Bradley Chubb when the, and, and all these these parts of this Denver defense, all the pass rushers on the inside, you're all Casey, Shelby Harris. Then you have the secondary. It's a hard defense to play against and practice against and go against. Same thing we said yesterday. Don't wring your hands over Drew Locke's interceptions in the scrimmage. This is a really, really, really good Denver defense. And everyone on offense, from Jerry Judy to Drew Locke to Melvin Gordon and DeMar Dotson, they're all struggling at one point or another with no offseason to speak of, no practices. And at this point, Chad, in training camp, every single summer, no matter what, the defense is always ahead of the offense. So a guy like DeMar Dotson, he played his whole career in Tampa Bay, didn't work out there. He joined the Broncos late. He's going to struggle. He's going to have his hiccups. But overall, those hiccups aren't as monumental as what Elijah Wilkinson does on a snap-by-snap basis. That's what it comes down to for me. Even if, I mean, I have no reason to <clears throat> to doubt Cecil's word. There's a reason I reach out to Cecil for things like this. And if, if we take him perfectly at his word and just say this is gospel, it doesn't dissuade me in any way, shape, or form, Zach, from the reality that he needs. they need to keep him there. They need to get more reps there. This is a guy that is yes. an eight-year starter at right tackle in the National Football League. And God bless Elijah Wilkinson. He's a guy that you love to have in a pinch to step in, and carry the water if a starter goes down. He's not starting caliber in the NFL right now, and it really makes your offense – it holds back the offense, plain and simple. So if you saw enough from Elijah Wilkinson to say as a coaching staff and Mike Munchak, let's give Dotson a few swings at the plate, you got to also give him time to settle in and kind of acclimate to going against the ones. So even though he might have struggled today, Tamar Dotson, it doesn't in any way, shape, or form make me want to go, for example, the news broke, Zach, today that the Vikings might actually cut Riley Reef or trade him if mm. they can, but yep. they might actually cut him. And I know everyone knows James Campbell. He wrote his first article for Mile High Huddle a few weeks back now before the DeMar Dotson signing, advocating for the Broncos to go out and get this guy. And at the time, before Dotson – Hey, man, I'm behind it. Go do it. You need depth. You don't know what Garrett Bowles' future is beyond 2020. Go get Riley Reef. I'm not sure that it makes as much sense now, especially because you have DeMar Dotson. So right. give Dotson the rope. Give him some time. Don't let one less than perfect um, sample size. And it was a smaller sample size. Elijah Wilkinson still had the lion's share of those first-team snaps, Zach. Dissuade you from giving him Dotson more of a seat at the table. And real quick, Frankie Apodaca jumping in with a super chat. Good to see you, my friend. It's been a minute and uh, we appreciate you. And thanks for joining us in the stream and supporting the cause, my friend. So that's my thoughts on it. It's, you know, but what about Riley Reef? What's your take on this? Is that something the Broncos should explore knowing that the Vikings are dangling him out there right now? I agree with you that before DeMar Dotson, Reef made a lot of sense, but if they picked up Dotson and they're tentative to get him in the starting lineup, what are they going to do with Riley Reef? Is he going to compete with Garrett Bowles? They're going to want to upset the apple cart there. I mean, it, it's too much instability, and we're two weeks out exactly, almost to the minute, from the Broncos season opener. I mean, we, we, we have to get the starting offensive line set, the five guys set, center and right tackle. To me, DeMar Dotson is a better tackle than Riley Reef. I would love to have the depth, but they don't need two of the same guy right now. And just, you know, hopping on to your previous point about why aren't they playing him, what message does it send to the locker room, Chad? If they're not going to play the better guy, if they're not going to do everything it takes to win and be the best team they can be, how do you sell that to the locker room? You're putting a a natural guard out there at right tackle when you just signed a natural right tackle and you're playing him with the third stringers, you're getting your quarterback chased down and killed. You're getting your, it's just like you said, holding back the entire offense. And 
anyone is naive to think other players in the locker room don't see that. They, they see the lack of investment in their own players, the lack of investment in Justin Simmons, the lack of investment in Philip Lindsay, the lack of doing whatever it takes to put the best product on the field. Because when you have Elijah Wilkinson at right tackle, that is not the best product you can put out. DeMar Dotson at right tackle would be. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Let the chips fall. Let the best man win. You know, it's like John Fox used to say, <clears throat> and it would drive Broncos fans crazy back in the Tebow Orton days while Orton would just lead the Broncos to loss after loss after loss in the early on in 2011. His message at the podium week in and week out until they finally made the move was, look, Kyle gives us the best chance to win. And, you know, it's a, it's a cliche. It's something coaches say. But in this case, it's true. And I think that Dotson is, gives you a better chance. And, yes. you know, maybe we, we need more of a sample size, okay? But, look, all I can go off of at this point is the film he's got and his resume as an 11-year vet and an 8-year starter at right tackle. Meanwhile, you got Elijah Wilkinson, who, again, God bless him. He's a great depth utility-type offensive lineman that you want to have. Those guys are valuable to have on the roster in a pinch. Can play guard, can play tackle. But he is not up to snuff when it comes to NFL standards at nope. right tackle. And, you know, NFL standards at tackle have dropped over the years because of the lack of coaching emphasis in, on the, in the college ranks. It's, you know, it's, it's devolved across the league. But still, if you want to give your young quarterback entering his second year and first year as the incumbent bona fide starter the best opportunity to succeed, Zach, you got to just face facts here and jump in with both feet on Dotson. And let him just figure it out. Let him get his legs underneath him going against Vaughn. Let him acclimate to going against that level of NFL speed rush and let the chips fall. By the way, the stream did a jump on us, so we got to do it the old-fashioned way with Mr. Boggins. Appreciate your support, my friend, and the super chat. He says, you bet your Jake butt that I'm playing D&D and listening to the pod. Side note, Prince is back on the market. Yes, indeed. So I'm pretty sure he, he put that super in before we uh doesn't give me a timestamp before we went live but really appreciate that my friend and then uh D D. by the way are you saying dungeons and dragons i'm i'm really serious about that are you playing D D, bro i for some reason this is a topic that just got brought up to me very recently by my brother i've i'm a fantasy guy zach and one time in high school i had a buddy who played dungeons and dragons it's like, talk me into doing it one night. And we were up till like four o'clock in the morning. Oh, thank you, John. Um, oh, this is a new one. And it was the most boring experience of my life. And I'm a fantasy <laughs> guy. So uh, yeah. Boggins jumps back in real quick to say, thank and you. thank you again, my friend. We're going to have you on the show here very, very soon. And we look forward to that. He says, when does Fangio find his Patrick Willis or Roquan Smith? Tackle is deep in the draft and good to – uh, good to decent in free agency. Hashtag Dylan Moses in the first round. Yeah. I mean, I think the Broncos believe Alexander Johnson has it in him to be that caliber of linebacker. Honestly, I think they do. But he needs a partner next to him. And even in the best sense, Zach, as much as I like Alexander Johnson, what he brings to the table, he is no Patrick Willis and he's no Roquan Smith. So the question is when – uh, if, if we're providing a realistic answer, Zach, it's 2021 at the soonest. I mean, you could have had him in Devin Bush or Devin White, but that's another story for another day. I mean, to answer the question, though, it's so hard to find those type of players. That's why when you mention how many Patrick Willis's have there been this generation, how many Navarro Bowman's, how many Luke Keekley's, you can count them on two hands. They're three down, all star, all pro, pro ball inside linebackers are really tough to find for whatever reason. It's just a, a tough position to master. And that's why when you have a guy like Willis and Bowman or have a guy like Roquan Smith, you literally run the crap out of them on defense. AJ Johnson is the closest thing to that, but he struggles in pass coverage. He still has a lot to prove. He still he has his flaws. He's nowhere near the stratosphere of Patrick Willis, who could be a future Hall of Famer. That's how good the guy was. Um, they need to get a guy who can just be the ebb and the flow, the yin and the yang to AJ Johnson. He's the thumper. He's the run support guy. Ninja pass coverage guy. That was supposed to be Sternot, and, and he got hurt, unfortunately. They brought in Mark Barron to play that role. You and I, Chad, don't think he's going to be anywhere near, again, Navarro Bowman or Patrick Willis. 
like you said, maybe next year with Sternod, he'll come back and be that guy, or maybe they'll draft a guy. But if you guys are expecting a Patrick Willis type impact from AJ Johnson, as good as AJ was last year, it, it's just not to that level yet. That's probably the weakest position on a really good Denver defense. 2021, because even if they don't go back to the well and draft a linebacker in first or second round, Justin Sternod, the soonest you're going to see him again, in all likelihood, 2021. So it's a pickle and uh, remains to be seen. But right now the Broncos are kind of taking the it takes a village type of approach yep. here to their linebacking core. All right, Dylan Von Arts jumping in. Really appreciate you, my friend. Bonafide superstar. Thank you, Everyone knows Dylan. Appreciate your generosity and support as always, my friend. He says, I just moved all my stuff from my El Camino back to my room due to the wildfires in Sonoma County. Finally able to watch in peace. Hashtag Broncos country. Hashtag MHH. Wow, man. Displaced by the wildfires in Sonoma County, Zach. And he is one committed Broncos fan, one committed member of this community to stick it with us here in the in the live stream. It's good to have you, Dylan. And we're glad to hear that you're back in your, uh, in your home, in your room and everything is okay for you. Yeah. Hopefully safe and sound. That's, that's scary. That's crazy. Um, I'm glad, you know, if things worked out for you, I'm glad they did. I'm glad you're safe and sound and thank you for tuning into the pod, but you know, that's secondary to your health and to your family. Uh, if there's anything we can do in any situation, please reach out and let us know. We got Mike Evans also jumping in, showing some love on super chat. It's thank you, consistent. Mike. The sun Rises in the morning, you see the moon every night, and you see Mike in the stream <laughs> every day. Showing love on Super Chat. We really appreciate you, Mike. Hope you know that. MHH, Mount Rushmore member. He says, I was at 7-Eleven and saw Demarcus Walker on a milk carton. Where is he? <laughs> haven't heard a word. Yeah, Zach, it, that brings up an interesting point because, yes, haven't heard much about Demarcus Walker this summer. He's in a contract year. And he might not make the 53. I'm not saying that as a bold prediction, but he might not. On the flip side of that, Zach, we saw Bill Kalar, the defensive line coach, on Monday. He, in the training camp, you know, stream they do every morning when they're having practice with, that Steve Atwater hosts. Forgive me, I forgot the training camp live. That's what it's called. He could be heard, uh, Bill Kalar, that is, saying that Draymond Jones looking real good. And, you know, he's one of those kind of, um, it's like a drill sergeant type old school coaches when it comes to the NFL. He's not a guy that hands out compliments easily. And so if he's complimenting Draymond Jones, you know that he's, he's really impressing people. What that means for Demarcus Walker, I'm not 100% sure because it depends on a few other pieces there on the D line, but it can't be great news. I hate to say it, but it seems like Demarcus Walker is uh, has a future with the unemployment line. It, it, he just never seemed to gel with the last coaching staff, this coaching staff. And Draymond Jones, I, I hate to admit it because I do like Demarcus Walker. He's just a better player. He, he's better against the run. He's better against the pass. He really came on last year. His film was great in the second half of the season. And like you ch- said, Chad, Bill Kolar, he's a lot like Fangio. If you get a compliment from him, it means – you know, 10 compliments at once. That's how impactful his words can be. Draymond is the future along the defensive line after Jarrell Casey, after Shelby Harris, Demarcus Walker. The indictment on Walker happened when they signed Christian Covington. That was yeah. not a shot at anyone but Demarcus Walker. And it seems like with no training camp, no preseason, and no standout plays this summer, Demarcus Walker's on the outside looking in, unfortunately, Chad. It's true. It's just the the lay of the land and not helping. He's one of these guys that even though he's got draft pedigree, the lack of a preseason this year is really hurting him just because yes. it's such a log jam on the defensive line this year and he needs time to shine. And when does he shine? The one thing you got to give DeMarcus Walker is when the lights are on yep. and he's out on the playing field in a game that matters. Maybe preseason obviously aren't games that count, but it's a game that matters when the lights are on, he's got that clutch gene, and he's just always around the ball. And that's what Zach and I have really loved about him. But he's – whatever it is, we don't know exactly what he's missing in terms of the total equation, something between the ears. Maybe it's something character-wise. I don't know for sure. I'm, I'm just guessing. But there is a missing component, Zach, and it's a shame because when he's on the field, if you could give him a specific role, he's really good at that role. 
And it's it's sad because you look back in re- revisionist history when he was drafted. What did the Broncos do? They immediately put two positions on his plate, outside linebacker, defensive end. You wonder if Vance Joseph retroactively ruined Demarcus Walker as a prospect. You wonder if he stunted his growth and just overwhelmed it initially and not brought him along slowly. It, Demarcus Walker is a guy who's going to get cut by the Broncos and go on to contribute for defense like Kansas City or Seattle or some, Baltimore or someone like that. Some team is going to get a good player that's going to unlock his abilities. But, Chad, that 2017 draft class, if he's gone, I mean, that has to be among the worst in recent NFL history, not just Broncos history, NFL history. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. I'm trying to find this. Yes, indeed, by the way. I'm trying to find this tweet from one of our colleagues on the uh, SI network from John Shipley, who does great work covering the Jacksonville Jaguars. I'll see if I can find it, but we have some, a lot of comments here wanting our take on the whole, uh, I don't know who Facebook user is, but thank you for being in the stream and thanks for your comment. You're one of many members of this community that want to talk a little bit about Leonard Fournette, who was released by the Jags today. And most fans, you know, he should be pretty fresh in your memory because he's the guy that sealed the fate of Adam Gotzis, sealed the fate of uh, the Josie Jewell slash Corey Nelson experiment, uh, ran 226 yards against the Denver Broncos, 220 something anyway, in week four, and basically single handedly kept the Jags in that game and gave uh, Gardner Minshew the opportunity with the final possession to drive down and win the game. But still, Zach, I'll see if I can find this uh, quote that I saw from John earlier because it is interesting. But he's got a career rushing average of four yards. He's a plotter. He's a between-the-tackles grinder. That's what he is. He's going to have that occasional game where he pops off and goes for a hundo or more. But more often than not, he's a three yards and a cloud of dust guy. And David Kilgore, by the way, jumping in. Appreciate that super chat, my friend. Thank you, David. He says, uh, what do you guys think is going on in Jacksonville? Are they tanking for Trevor? (laughs) LOL, yes, they are. First, their D, uh, their defensive end, Yannick Ngakwe, was traded, and now they're running back. Indeed, and by the way, David Kilgore, MHH, Mount Rushmore member as well. Much love to you, my friend. Zach, your take, your take on the idea of Leonard Fournette hitting the market, not so much having to do with the Broncos, but what you think his stock is now. Uh, what is it, four or five years removed from being a first-round pick, top five pick? I mean, what does it say, though, that the Jags couldn't get anything from him for him? I mean, they couldn't trade him for a bag of chips. They couldn't trade him for a conditional seventh round pick. It says to me that the NFL being devalued on running backs, they don't want to take a plotting guy who doesn't want have a lot of tread left on his tires. To me, he's Royce Freeman with better hands. I don't want that guy on the team. I mean, he's solid, but very unspectacular. It, it, he'll get a job somewhere this season, Chad. I mean, just being that draft pedigree, like you mentioned, being a first-round pick and having some success in Jacksonville. Not the guy for the Broncos, though. They have two running backs right now they don't even know what to do with. They don't even have an RB1 by title yet. So adding Leonard Fournette to that is just not conducive to what they want to do in the backfield. He'll play this season, but any Broncos fan wanting to sign him, I just don't understand that. They, it's the last position they need. Sign a cornerback. Sign a guard. You know, Sign a safety. Don't sign a, a running back that won't help you more than the guys already on the roster. All right, I'm look, here's, here's what you got from – hold on, let me see here if he – if this is the article, I'm not going to waste too much time trying to track this thing down because it's not very Broncos applicable, but it was really insightful. Um, let me see if this is it. In three seasons, Fournette played in 36 regular season games, rushed 666 times for 2,631 yards, averaging four yards per carry, 17 touchdowns, along with 134 receptions for 1,000 yards and two receiving touchdowns. Played in a couple of postseason games, but – he boils it down, and this isn't the article. I don't know. But I'll, I'll see if I can find it later. But the main takeaway is that, yes, you know, he's a first-round pick, and he's got some talent, but his career rushing average is four yards per carry, and his 100-yard game, Zach, although when he did pop, they popped, were very actually a lot more few and far between than I think a lot of fans realized. So he's just not a guy I think that's going to have a lot of value. I think he's going to not have a hard time finding a new home, But if he's hoping to find some kind of a paycheck out there that's, you know, first round caliber, let's just say, I think it's going to be a pretty cold market. 
Plus, if he's hoping to be the guy somewhere, meaning the only guy, it's not going to happen. There's a handful of teams out there who have one central running back and not a committee approach. Even the Broncos have two running backs. So, yeah, I agree with you, Chad. Fournette will play this season, but in a very uh, timeshare type role. He's not the star anymore, and you can argue that he really never was in Jacksonville. Yeah, I would track down this quote, but we're already bogging down the, the show. So let me move on. Sorry about that, gang. Zeus McPeak Zeus. in the house. Showing that love. Really appreciate you, my friend. And, uh, you know, you just, our community, Stu was one of the first to really begin the super chat superstar um, component to our show. And he has been consistent since we started doing the live streams. You know, the Huddle Up podcast has existed now for dating back to 2016 is when it was started. Zach and I have been partnered on it for a couple of years now. I think this will be the third season. Let's see. Yep. Yeah. Third season together, but it was a literally a year ago in September. So we're one year out from us deciding to start taking our, our daily podcast, which we had, we had been doing daily as a pre-recorded episode that we would talk, edit it, upload it to the stream, just like most podcasts people listen to pre-edited production to it being a, daily live stream that we then take that audio and upload it for the podcast. The focus being on the live, the podcast being after the fact, and both of them are important, but Zach, Stu is very much a pioneer in that respect and helped us get this show off the ground on its live footing, that is. And so we love Zeus, as we call him, and as he says here, hit the like button, please. Takes ownership in the community, exemplifies, embodies MHH. Zeus was the OG on the Mount Rushmore chat, a super, yep. super chat superstars. I mean, he's been around since day one. And I just saw a comment from Stu. I mean, he was even around from the 24-7 Facebook Live days. So he's mm-hmm. been, uh, you know, in this realm for quite a while. Stu, I definitely appreciate that. I, I Now I, I hear, I recognize your name from those Facebook. It seems so long ago now. It seems so archaic. But those Facebook comment streams, Stu, I appreciate your support as always. And it's great to see you, you know, years later, hang with us now on the podcast. Real quick, shout out to our Periscope Twitter viewers, Rebel Dipstick. He's stoked. There's only two weeks left to go. Indeed, we got to eat our hearts out, but it'll be here before you know it. Two weeks from tonight, your Denver Broncos debut against the Tennessee Titans. And Zach, Thursday, well, we can decide which day we want to do it, Wednesday or Thursday. Maybe since we're having Glenn on Wednesday, we do it Thursday. But then again, Thursday is supposed to be the our Mile High Mailbag Day either way. We need to make our official 53-man roster prediction because the deadline is Saturday at 2 p.m. The roster has to be cut from its current standing of 80 players down to 53. And then, of course, it's changing from a 10-man practice squad to a 16-man practice squad and six of those spots. So those six new spots on the practice squad, they can be veterans. So it can be guys who long ago ran out of practice squad eligibility, but that can be kept on the practice squad if they pass through waivers unclaimed. Um, so we'll see it's, we'll, we'll pick one of those days. Probably we'll do it Thursday, make it early in the show and then get to the mailbag. I don't know. Plan on it though, here in the very near future, we got Steve Griffith coming in. One of our Facebook supporters also likes to cross over and support what we do here on YouTube. Appreciate you, Steve. He says, I'm more concerned with right tackle. Can we possibly work a trade for someone? Maybe wait and see on reef from Minnesota. It's a possibility they're dangling him. I just don't think, Zach, the Denver Broncos are going to move on that. Just knowing Elway, like, I think, look, this isn't the first time we've heard that there could be some movement with Reef in Minnesota. Maybe the Broncos called on it. Maybe they checked on it. I don't know. But, again, it's similar to the to the same thing we were talking about earlier, the idea with Prince of Mukamara that if the Broncos didn't move on it then, right. well, but something has changed for the Broncos, Zach. Juwan James opted out. That was not part of the equation when the initial buzz happened in the spring, of course, that Reef could be on the trading block. Juwan James was penciled in to be the starting right tackle. So maybe that does change the equation for John Elway. I, but look how long it took them to sign a right tackle after James opted out and after Wilkinson was, had surgery, Chad. He was on, you know, he was mending surgery and an injury and it took all that time. And you can argue 
Would they have signed a tackle if Dotson didn't become available? Or would they go into camp having just Wilkinson and, and Jake Rogers and Calvin Anderson? I can't see Elway picking up another tackle right now. They're trying to talk up Wilkinson. They have DeMar Dotson. They just picked up a tackle in Paulo, uh, the former Utah tackle. They have a couple young guys they like. If they did not sign DeMar Dotson, Riley Reef would be a possibility. But they're not going to pick up two guys when they don't even have a starter yet You know, on that offensive line at right tackle. All right, John. Good to see you as well, my friend, John Libick on Facebook. Yeah, we got a few uh, punk rockers in the community. Chase is one of them. Chris is one of them. And uh, yeah, bad religion. If you know punk rock, you know bad religion. You can't. It's in. Uh, it's unmistakable. Um, all right, let's grab one of our great superstars. We haven't seen him for a while. He does you know. have a business to run called Discount Audio and Wheels. Appreciate you. Thank you. As always, my friend. Thanks. Hope everything's going good with your business and in your neck of the woods. He says, hope everyone's doing well. Not too worried about linebacker. I expect a veteran cut on some other team that could help us more with uh, depth than uh, at cornerback. I'm guessing he's saying also, which could be the cuts are coming this week, Zach. And that's going to be another opportunity for the Broncos to maybe move on somebody. But what corner is going to get cut that has more familiarity than Prince of Mugamara? I, I just don't understand it. There's no guy out there that's going to get cut who can come in from day one and not really have to even use the playbook or look at the playbook. He knows the system. He was with the secondary coach and the head coach now who was a defensive coordinator in Chicago. And people are saying, you know, he got cut by the Raiders. They didn't have those coaching pieces in Vegas. They didn't have the need for a Mukamara like the Broncos have. They have young guys who they're high on. The Broncos have injury concerns right now behind Boye. There's a lot of question marks. So to me, maybe linebacker, I could see that. Uh, a, a true veteran inside linebacker, maybe not now after Mark Barron. But cornerback, there's no guy that's going to shake loose in the next week that has a better match on paper than Prince of Mukamara. And like we've been saying, though, if they didn't sign him then, they're not. I don't think they're going to sign him now. They just, for whatever reason, they don't want the guy. Good point, man. Good point. Uh, Derek Green jumping in. Good to see you. He says, hey, guys, first live pod since the storm had to evacuate. Well, I hope everything shook out okay for you. I hope you and the missus are doing yeah. okay. Let us know. And, and uh, that you escaped unscathed from, from the storm, my friend. <laughs> Definitely let us know. Um, all right, let me check something real quick, Zach, here. I don't want to. I, I fear that the stream jumped a few people, so I just got to check it on the back end really quick and see who we might have missed. Zach, I don't know if – well, actually, this is a question for John. John, I don't know if you have Terry's super, if you can get it. If not, I'll put it in real quick. Because um, for me, it jumps. There he is. North of the 49th parallel. You guys know how it goes. This guy is definitely an MHHOG, and it exemplifies the state of being. Hashtag. Appreciate you, Terry. You, Terry. He says, what effect does the James injury have on the division, in your opinion? Derwin. Okay, thank you. For a second there, I'm like, then as soon as you said Derwin, like literally as as you were saying, I'm like, oh, yeah, duh. You know, it's so sad because this is such a supremely talented player. Yeah. And just a gifted stud, you know. It's really a bummer. But it does have an effect. It does take away from the Chargers being like an almost close to overpoweringly potent defense. Like – it's going to be a, a toss-up between which of these two defenses are the best in the division, the Chargers or the Broncos. And losing Derwin James, let's face it, that's that's going to set the Chargers back. The Broncos, I think, maintain their their spot atop the AFC West as the top defense. But even without him, Zach, you know they have a lot of good DBs in that in that secondary. So mostly it's pretty cornerback heavy without without Derwin, but. It will it will affect the the chemistry, and I think in terms of, you know, if you're ranking defenses and how it shakes out, the Broncos' defense definitely stands out now as superior with James no longer part of their equation. Uh, you know, I know he's a division rival. I know he's a kind of a hated player in Broncos country, but as a football fan, I mean, it's so unfortunate that we just can't see a healthy Derwin James on the field. And Kenneth Booker right here nails the comparison. It's absolutely like Bob Sanders, just a supremely elite talented athlete who cannot stay on the field. And when he's on the field, he makes impact play after impact play. 
how it affects the division, just like Chad said, it makes the Chargers defense worse. It'd be like the Broncos losing Justin Simmons or Von Miller, that type of impact on that defense. They're still going to be good. I don't think better than the Broncos because it comes down to coaching. And I'll take Fangio over Anthony Lynn and uh, what they have going on in, in uh, Los Angeles. It's going to hurt them. It's not, you know, if anything, though, they know how to deal without Derwin James. Unfortunately, they know how to play without him. I'm, I'm sure they have the contingency in place. And uh, it sucks. It, it really does suck for them. But it's good for the Broncos and it's good for the West. That's a good point that Kenneth brings up about Bob Sanders. And you're always going to wonder what could have been. I remember the year the Colts finally won the Super Bowl and Peyton Manning was able to dispense with that that couldn't win the big one reputation that he had, similar to what Matty Ice, Matt Ryan has right now in the NFL. is really good quarterback, very productive, prolific, but he just can't win the big one. That was Peyton Manning's reputation for a long time, and they finally got over the hump in 06. And the reason for that wasn't just Peyton Manning's just dominance, but – Bob Sanders missed a lot of that season and finally got healthy for the playoffs. And that Colts defense went from being basically, you know, a doorknob that opponents could just score on, move the ball on at will to all of a sudden he was just the catalyst that tightened him up just in time for the playoffs. And they ended up playing good enough defense to, to win it all. So yeah, Derwin James, it's unfortunate, but it's good news for the Broncos and you hate to see it happen, but it's good news for, for the Broncos, Derek Green jumped in on Super Chat. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Derek. He says, uh, how's it going, guys? Finally able to be live. We stay in Louisiana, as you know, and this hurricane destroyed our hometown. But you guys and Broncos country, keep up uh, pushing, be blessed and safe. Destroyed our hometown. For a second there, I read it that it destroyed his home. I was like, oh, yeah, man. I thought the same thing. So glad to hear that you're okay, and the, hopefully the fam, everyone's rocking down there, doing okay, and our thoughts and prayers, of course, go out to that that neck of the woods in our country, Zach, that, man, Florida, in fact, I was just talking to my wife about this last night, Florida, and just the whole South, you know, she was talking about a friend that was uh, planning on moving to Florida from uh, the Rockies. Don't, and Don't do it. Don't do well, it. <laughs> well, you know. Anyone who's been to Florida, it's especially if you're close to the water, to the ocean, it's a nice place to be. Um, it's yeah. nice. But you got the hurricane season, man, would yeah. trip me out. It would just worry me all the time. And that includes all the Gulf states, of course, in, in Louisiana. But, Derek, we're glad to hear you're doing okay, my friend. And, Zach, I know you're a, you're a Florida veteran, so you know all about it. Yeah, not by choice, Chad. I mean, I was born into the Florida lifestyle, and it's everything, trust me, guys, it's everything you read about on Twitter. It's everything that the Florida man depicts in the news stories that you read. But, you know, hurricane season is serious, and every single year, Floridians are just like, oh, here we go again. Get the supplies, get the milk, get the bread. It just becomes a way of life. Uh, Derek, fortunately, you're okay. I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your hometown. Hopefully the cleanup efforts have begun and you don't lose power, no property damage, things like that. It's a really unfortunate time of the year, Chad. I, I, I was always happy on November 1st. That was the end of hurricane season, and we knew that, okay, no more. We can relax for another year. Eclipse Stormborn jumping in from Philly. The city of brotherly love. And you know, Eclipse brings the love. Really appreciate yep. the support, as always, my friend. And tip of the cap to that awesome profile pic you continue to rock. Props to you, my friend. Uh, he says, peace and love from Philly. Hashtag state of being. Hashtag MHHUN. We're bringing Broncos fans together from all across the country, all across the world. And love seeing that. Love that hashtag, too. MHHUN, which you coined, Troy. So, Props to you, my friend, and thanks for being in the stream. All right, Zach, let's grab also – oh, wait, we got uh, Dale in the house. He's saying, still don't know the downside of trying Reisner at right tackle. Now, this is a topic that Zach and I differ on because I would not be opposed to it. In fact, I've advocated for it at different points this summer from the time Juwan James opted out, but it just doesn't seem to be something, Zach, the Broncos are seriously entertaining on any level. Because the downside is you make left guard weak. You're, you're filling one hole and, and creating another. Who would you play at left guard? It'd be like moving Reisner to center because he played there in college. I, I mean, leave him where he is right now. He's thriving at left guard. He's a, a perennial Pro Bowl type guy. Why 
try to take from one area and, and to fix another. It just doesn't make sense to me. You signed a true right tackle in DeMar Dotson. He has nine years of experience, 100 career starts, and he's competing, competing against a natural swing guard. There should be no competition or discussion. Get DeMar Dotson at, on the field at right tackle and go do work. A lot of fans who advocate for Dalton Reiser to be kicked out to tackle – they say, well, look, you, you know, Wilkinson's more of a natural guard. Put him at left guard. And if you don't like that, Natani Muti, the sixth round pick. Well, let me tell you something. Muti's going to take some time to marinate. And let me yeah. read you this quote from Fangio today, who was asked directly about how Natani Muti has done in training camp. This is Fangio quote, Muti's been good overall, up and down, like you would expect from a guy who's a rookie and a rookie who's missed a lot of football uh, during his college career. He's had flashes of good play. And flashes of not so good play. He had a tough night the other day in practice, referencing the, the stadium scrimmage. He would have given up a sack or two, at least a couple quarterback hits, if it were a game. He's not where he needs to be, obviously, but we like the player. Close quote. So, Zach, there's obviously a lot of upside with Muti, and the Broncos recognize and value that, but he's nowhere close to being a guy you plug in at left guard next to Garrett Bowles, who is so volatile. You know, he needs that stability of having Reisner there. And it wouldn't surprise me, Zach, if that's probably the motivating drive in terms of rationale, why the Broncos just aren't moving Reisner. They don't want to mess with Garrett Bowles because they're still hoping that final five, six games last year was the new norm for him, that he turned a corner and they don't want to mess with that equation. Great point, Chad. Yeah, the Broncos are really walking on eggshells at, with Garrett Bowles' position, having a new center, being a rookie, having a new right tackle, whoever that will be. There's a lot of different factors at play, and it's like if one domino falls, they all come tumbling down, so they have to really pick their battles. I just don't like playing players out of position. If riser moves from right to left, like you just made great point. I mean, left to right, you're losing that boon for Garrett Bowles. And to put a rookie in Muti who still needs development in the NFL, he's a very raw but talented prospect. It's going to make Bowles more of a liability than he already is. <laughs> Reisner was the best thing to happen to Garrett Bowles. He's never had a guard next to him uh, to that level. So why... Why ruin that? Because you don't want to play a natural right tackle who you just signed over an unnatural tackle in Elijah Wilkinson. It doesn't make sense. Shout out to Andy from Kansas, who was letting us know that it's that Facebook user. He's letting us know that Leonard Fournette question. Um, shout out to you, Andy. Stu Meat jumping in on Super Chat. Been a minute since we saw Stu Meat. And we appreciate the <laughs> Super Chat, my friend. He Thank says, you. yes, sir. Keep up the great work at MHH. Aloha, Broncos country. So we might have yet another great member of this community hailing from Hawaii, potentially. Maybe not. Maybe I'm just, you know, he just says aloha. But thank you, Stu. Me appreciate your support. Um, all right. Let me see really quick here. John, I'm trying to see. Oh, hold on one second. From Hardy on Facebook, we want to give our Facebook audience an opportunity to be a part of this conversation. And Hardy says, what's going on with the running back competition? Does either guy have an edge at this point? Now, Hardy, you might have missed last night's podcast when we talked about the takeaways from Saturday's scrimmage. And one of them, and I wrote the takeaways, and then Zach and I talked about this. We each kind of riffed on it is that Philip Lindsay, I think, is going to maintain his role, even if it just turns out, Zach, to be a nominal role, as the starting running back. Melvin Gordon, from a snapshot perspective, it's going to at least be 50-50. I could see it be Philip Lindsay maintains starter role so that he gets all those starts on his resume and all that stuff. Um, it's at least the Broncos can do at this stage because he's had a great camp. Yes. While Melvin Gordon kind of – serves as the bell cow, if you will, might even have few, a few more touches per game on average than Philip Lindsay. But Philip Lindsay, it's actually kind of the role you want him to have. You want him to be the spark plug. You want him to be the leader. And you want him to be that change of pace guy who can just take it to the house at the drop of a hat any given play. You lull the defense to sleep by pounding Gordon through the tackles for a few series, and then you throw in Lindsay. Maybe have him run a pattern, maybe have him do an outside zone, quick toss, whatever it might be. And the defense just isn't quite, they're kind of in the in a trance based on the 
the game speed from Gordon, and boom. That's why they call him change of pace running backs. Now, I'm not calling, I'm not reducing Philip Lindsay Zach to a change of pace because a running back, because I do believe he is a bona fide number one NFL running back. But as a guy who is, even though he put on weight, you know, he's 190, 195 pounds, still soaking wet, five foot eight. You don't want him to carrying the ball 20 times a game. You want someone who can take some of that load off of him. That's why I think it could work out well, although I still say, look, that money should have gone to Phillip, and Royce could do what they're probably going to ask Melvin Gordon to do this year. Uh, but, you know, that's a ship that sailed a long time ago. This competition went exactly as we thought it would because no one keeps Philip Lindsay down. No one puts Philip Lindsay in a corner, Chad. I, that's right. I, literally every step of the way from Pee Wee to high school to college, he's overcome every single player standing in his way. He has had an excellent training camp. Seeing a pissed off, motivated, just an alpha Philip Lindsay this offseason has been an awakening uh, for me at least. And Melvin Gordon, you know, he came in to Denver late. He has a rib injury. He hasn't really stood out in training camp too much. They're going to feed him that that those carries to justify that contract but Vic Fangio even said today I believe it was he doesn't know if the running game will be better if you pay a running back eight million dollars per year in this day and age you there should be no question at all no doubt in your mind I don't care about a pandemic I don't care about training camp or the preseason if you pay a running back eight million dollars making him among the top seven highest paid his position there's no doubt it should be better so to say that is is a win to me for Philip Lindsay. If he made the competition murky, that's a huge win for number 30. It's like he said, to paraphrase him, doesn't matter who they bring in, doesn't matter who they pay, you, they got to get through me, and that's really hard to do. And Melvin Gordon, he might not have realized that quite yet, but by the time the season is done, he for sure will know that that is an absolutely yeah. true statement. He'll learn. Uh, sh- shout out to Mac, by the way, who, who was on Periscope. Appreciate you joining us. Um, going from YouTube to Periscope, wanted to try it out. Jake Gerard, one of our superstars, jumping in. Appreciate you, bro. Thank you, Jake. Uh, 21 and 7, week one prediction. 21 to 7, excuse me. His week one prediction, Broncos Titans, is 21 7 uh, for the Broncos, I'm assuming. 14 more days. Let's go. Zach, do you think this defense keeps the Tennessee Titans, Ryan Tannehill, Derrick Henry to seven points at mile high? Mm, I think it's a possibility. I, my personal final score prediction is like 19-16. I, it's going to be a slow, grinded out, defensive-oriented type game, kind of sloppy in the first half, and things will pick up in the second half. They have the defense. We talked about this yesterday. I think the game plan is to sell out, load the box, stop Derrick Henry, and make Ryan Tannehill beat you. If they do that, I, they can really limit that tannehill let passing attack. He's not that great of a quarterback. And Jarrell Casey, don't discount that revenge game factor, that motivation. They could hold him there. I, I still think, though, it's going to be like a 2017-1916 type game, but a Broncos victory nonetheless. They stopped Derrick Henry last year. Week six, they shut him down and forced Marcus Mariota to carry the load. He couldn't do it, so they pulled him. I would say Tannehill gave him a slight lift, but it still wasn't enough against Fangio's defense. So if they can – basically, if the defense can repeat what they did last year to this Titans offense, Drew Locke's going to do enough to get a dub, and I think that's how it's going to shake out. Casey wants to know, was Dotson really that bad today? Right tackle is such a concern – it's not so much that he was that bad. All right. We want to be clear in terms of, you know, let's, let's not hang on the hyperbole. He just, it wasn't great. Neither he nor Elijah Wilkinson today with the ones looked great according to Cecil Lammy. So we'll see, you know, hopefully it wasn't enough to change the Broncos uh, opinion on giving him continued more reps with the ones. We don't think it will, but it's, it's no cause for panic at this stage quite yet. Uh, Christy, wow. the queen of MHH, jumping in with an extremely generous super. We love you. you. We appreciate you. And uh, like Stu, Christy is someone that has been with MHH a long time and with Zach a long time, dating back to the Facebook days on yes. 472. Very and loyal. Christy, we appreciate everything you do for this community, and you mean a lot to us. She says, you know, I love you guys, but I have to degree, uh, disagree on Dotson. Hopefully I'm wrong. What do you disagree on though? What do you mean that uh, trying to, what do you think? What do you think she's disagreeing with us on? That he's going to be an upgrade for the roster, I'm assuming, or he's going to be the, the solution to right tackle. And I, I could see it being a busted kind of move. I can see him not being better than what they've had in the years past, but 
can he be better than a guard masquerading a tackle who's coming off surgery? That to me is the biggest factor. And the answer to that question is a resounding yes. And as long as that answer is yes, he should be playing right tackle. We shall see. And Christy, if we miss the mark on that, just clarify, John will grab it and uh, we will address it. And thank you as always, my friend. We'll, we'll talk to you here very, very soon. We got Mundungus, the Wizzy and the Hizzy jumping in. Really appreciate you, my friend. Thank you. As consistent as we talked about, he's up there with, Terry's up there with Stu. He's up there with Christy. He's up there with uh, Mike. Much love to you. Another Mike, by the way. Are you ready for some football? And he's got the music. I can hear it now, right? The old Hank Williams song. <laughs> I think they changed it, but it's still the same words, if I'm not I, don't, I can't it's remember. It's not as good as it used to be. It, it's just not as good. It's not as exciting, right? It's not. No. It's just not quite the same. But uh, thank you, Wizard. Broncos Wizard in the house. We appreciate you. All right, guys. We're at 59 minutes. So we have to rapid fire the remaining superstars because we don't leave anybody out in the cold. Our friend Adon, a six foot ten Mexican Thank on you. YouTube, is his handle. Jump it in. Appreciate you on super chat. Says glad I was able to see the second half. Hashtag state of being. Really appreciate you, Adon. And it's better late than never. And of course, it's just not the same stream if you're not in the stream with us, my dog. So thanks for for jumping in. Uh, in the second half, and let me see here. We got – everyone knows Chris was on the show on Wednesday night. Appreciate you, my friend. Another one of the Thank most you. consistent. Chat is on fire tonight. Don't leave before you click those little thumbs up. Appreciate you, my friend. Love it. And wait till you see this, dude. I'm going to show you this uh, signed copy that I got from Glenn of that Bad Religion book, and it is really, really special. All right, let me see. I want to make sure we got uh, Kevin Peterson. Yo, Florida is cool. Of course, nope. KP is in Florida. And, uh, <laughs> you know, friends can disagree, I guess. Right, Zach, and fel- fellow Floridians? Florida is not literally cool or, or figuratively cool. <laughs> I don't know what part of Florida you're in, Kevin, but I was uh, born and raised in uh, South Florida, and it's hot, it's humid, there's a lot of bugs, bats, sports town, hurricanes. There's not a lot of redeeming qualities when you move past the beaches uh, of living in South Florida. So we'll, we'll agree to disagree. All right, one or two more here that we have missed. The Wizard, again, jumping in to say, and thank you, <laughs> Mundungus. Chad keeps talking punk rock, but I can almost guarantee he is a closet. And uh, oh, sync. oh, in sync. <laughs> yeah. I pretend like you don't know, Chad. You know. <laughs> um, I I remember him from the '90s, kind of. But uh, oh no no no, Justin Timberlake or was he Backstreet Boys? I think he was in sync. Well, you know, you've exposed me now, Mike. I have to <laughs> turn the camera so you can see this wall of just <laughs> the shrine. Appreciate the super, my friend. Um, all right. Let me just double check on the back end. I know there's some some uh, superstars that we have missed that we're going to get before we get out of here, including Jordan and Mr. Boggins here. He jumps in to say, appreciate it, by the way, my friend. I say we trade for a premier tackle so that we at least have one. Then going into next season, we have him and James and a top draft pick. You know, I don't know, man. I don't envy John Elway at this moment because they don't know what the future holds at their offensive tackle position. They got John James under contract next year, but you never know what which way the wind's going to blow and whether he's going to show up for you. Garrett Bowles is going to be a free agent next year. DeMar Dotson, a free agent. Uh, Elijah Wilkinson will be a free agent next year. Basically, every tackle they have currently on the roster with a modicum of NFL experience is going to be a free agent. I don't know exactly what Riley Reef's contract is. I didn't look at that before we went live tonight, but, you know, it's a possibility. I just don't see it happening, gang. I wouldn't get your hopes up. But can we please devote a high round draft pick to a tackle instead of going receiver, receiver, or going with another position? They've neglected it for too long now. They finally took a chance on Garrett Bowles, and it seems like ever since then, Chad, they've been so uh, gun shy and and so hurt by that selection. They've they've yet to go back to that well. They got to put resources into the O line. They cannot keep getting by with bandit after bandit after bandit, especially at right tackle. And for the reason you just mentioned. Bowles, Wilkinson, and Dotson are all not under contract for next season. They need two stars more than likely. So if not a veteran next offseason, it's not going to happen, I think, 
now. I'm not going to make a trade now, but starting next offseason, a lot of resources being put into the offensive line. They have to continue building around Drew Locke. It's not a one-year project. It's an ongoing thing that needs to happen for the next half decade. And this kind of speaks to what Jordan, uh, jumping in, appreciate you, Jordan. Thank you. On Super Chat, it kind of speaks to the same topic. He says, we went wide receiver, wide receiver in this draft. We're yes. going to go right tackle, left tackle in the next. <laughs> they might have to. I doubt it, but, you know, <laughs> we'll see, dude. Honestly, the way it could shake out, Zach, Garrett Bowles could end up defying everybody's expectations and have a great 2020 season, the first season in his four-year career that justifies in any way, shape, or form his first-round pedigree. And the Broncos might pay him. They might give him a deal in November at some point if he's having a good season, get him extended, and I think he would take that money because, well, because, all right? And if that happens, it solves half your problem. But still, you don't know what to expect from Juwan James, and that's a pickle the Broncos can't get out of. The Juwan James thing, like, they are stuck with that. So, I don't know. That's a that's a problem that you kick down the road, you know, 2021. We'll figure what the, what the, the solution is when the time comes. For now, it seems, Zach, it's, it's Bowles, it's Wilkinson, it's Dotson. And, you know, one guy that I like, though, that have, I've seen in, in camp thus far and that's had some surprisingly good play is Calvin Anderson. Don't sleep on him. Like, if he were to get an opportunity, I wouldn't be surprised if he were to kind of knock it out of the park. But – you know, he's got a few guys he'll have to leap, including Jake Rogers, who's an old Munchak guy. But I bet you when we do reveal our 53-man roster uh, predict- predictions, whether it ends up being Wednesday or Thursday, maybe I'll have Calvin Anderson on that, hmm. that uh, prediction set. You know what? You know, he'll make me eat my words maybe in a couple of years from now, but this is why I'm still not sure about going KJ Hamler in the second round. It just seemed like they overcompensated so much for not having weapons for a lock last year. They took Jerry Judy in the first, another receiver in the second. Would they like to have that pick back now to take a tackle? I sure would. We've been, we were calling for it while they were on the clock in the second round and they waited and waited and waited and look what happened. You have Garrett Bowles and you have a guy who opted out and having Wilkinson as your starter and being forced to sign Demar Dotson. And you don't even know still with two weeks left who your right tackle is going to be. So they have to, this is why I've been saying my last point. They have to start investing in offensive tackle, whether it's free agency or preferably the draft. They cannot keep kicking the can down the road because they run into the same issue year in and year out. Chad W we, we jumping in on super chat. Appreciate you. It's good to see you. It's been a while since we've seen you. So thank you. And welcome back. Has our training camp hampered our record expectation this season? Maybe it's eight and eight, you know, one, Bad practice from the offense really hasn't hampered my outlook. You know, they'll bounce back again. You got to think about all of the factors that led to that could help or contribute to Drew Locke in the offense having a bad day at the office in the scrimmage. We talked about it yesterday, but Cliff Notes version is the defense knows what's coming. They've been going against them every single day. The formations, the route concepts, the personnel groupings. Nothing is fooling this Broncos defense at this stage. No matter what the Broncos offense throws at them, you're not going to be able to say that against the Tennessee Titans. That's It's fresh opponent, brand new. There's no film on Locke playing in Pat Shermer's scheme. So, no, Zach, it hasn't affected mine. I don't know about you. No, I'm still holding firm to nine and seven being the baseline and ten and six being my record prediction for the season. A wild card berth, uh, putting the Broncos back on the NFL map, being relevant again, getting some national hype from the from the media again, and going and you know playing fairly deep into January. I'm not going to sit here and say the Broncos are going to hoist the Lombardi in February. They're a couple years away from doing that, if that soon. But they have all the pieces and the horses, no pun intended, to be a playoff team this year. If they won seven games last year, what's another two, three wins with this roster and this coaching staff? No, I expected this. And I talked about this yesterday. You want Locke to get these mistakes out of the way now, not two weeks, five weeks, three months down the road right now. It's going to make him a better quarterback. So one bad practice or one battle at right tackle or whatever, you know, a cornerback question, safety question, it's not going to prevent me from holding firm to my prediction. I still think 10 and six is the Broncos record this season. Shout out to a couple of new listeners on Facebook. We got Juan here. What's up? We got Daniel here. Appreciate you guys joining us and uh, keep coming back. We go live every night, six, the local time, mountain time, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. 
um, eight to nine if you're on Eastern time. All right, there's one more here that I see, maybe two. Dale jumping in, showing his generosity that wow. is he has wanted to do. And thank you, thank Dale. You so know, much. Uh, much love and respect to you, my friend. He says, money and moves aside at running back, both Gordon and Lindsey are getting good reviews from camp. True. Let's hope they both prove to be worthy of touches in all situations. Great point. And then he says, great job again, gents. Appreciate you. you, Dale. And that's basically what Zach and I, <clears throat> you know, the outlook, we still might be a little bit, uh, I don't know, bitter is the wrong word because that assumes that you have a stake. Not so much bitter, but, you know, we still have all right. Yes. Okay. Apprehensive at the fact that the, the Broncos didn't give Lindsay the money and it would have been different if John Elway wouldn't have kicked the barn door open on that as a possibility. But nevertheless, we quickly devolved and made sure everyone understood that this is nothing against Melvin Gordon. He's a really good NFL running back. We expect him to do good things for the Broncos here. We just don't expect him to completely unseat and eclipse Philip Lindsay. Combined, right. as Dale says here, Zach, I think they're going to both be worthy of those touches and do some really good things for this team in, in 2020. I have no doubt that, you know, Philip Lindsay and Melvin Gordon is better than Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman. I just doubt whether Melvin Gordon is worth $8 million per year when he's getting outplayed and outclassed in training camp so far by Philip Lindsay, the $750,000 man. We all know it would happen. We all predicted this would happen. Yet the Broncos went all in on Melvin Gordon to have that potent one two punch to bring a veteran in who can catch passes. They don't think Philip Lindsay can do that. Yes. Working together in tandem, they should be an asset. It should make the Broncos' ground game better than it was last year. But is it going to be worth what they paid Melvin Gordon? Is it going to be worth pissing off Philip Lindsay in the process and making him disgruntled and sending another message to the locker room that if we draft you and you play well and you exceed your contract, we're not going to pay you. We're going to go pay somebody else. We're going to bring somebody else in. We're not going to give you your money now. The more the Broncos do that, the, the worse reputation they have internally. And no one's going to want to play for them after a while, Chad. So they should be good. Uh, you know, I, I'm still apprehensive. I'm still rolling my eyes about the Gordon dish. I don't care. I mean, they, they overpaid for the guy. They didn't need him. It was a luxury signing. They could have drafted a guy. They could have signed a cheaper guy. They could have went to the season with Royce Freeman and Philip Lindsay. I would have been okay with that. But – Lindsay will never be held down. Lindsay will never be RB2. He's just too talented, and now he's too motivated. And you put those two things together, he will never get off the field, Chad. He is going to be your RB1 now and through the rest of the year. Kenneth Booker, really quick, wants to know, Panama City on a scale of 1 to 10, Zach. I was never really up that far. I was, you know, in Central Florida down to South Florida. I, I don't really have much experience there. I mean, I've heard decent things, but you know, there's some there's some nice pockets in Florida. I'm not going to lie. There's some really cool areas. As a whole, though, you live there 25 years. You've seen it all. You've experienced it all, and you kind of know Florida for what it is. People think Florida is either Fort Lauderdale or South Beach, and there's so many different cities and bad cities and crappy areas. A lot yeah. of people don't know about. So very densely populated state. Yeah. Um, all right, last one here, and then we got to get out of here. Mundungus getting his Raz in to keep the scales balanced. Raz and Chad, now he's Raz and Zach. He says, Zach is one of those guys that sits in his car crying to Brian McKnight's <laughs> one last cry. Had one time that play. happened, Mundungus, one time. I don't. I honestly don't know who Brian McKnight is. R&B singer? Okay, thank you. Um, M- Mundungus, appreciate the, the yeah. support as always, thank man. You. And even uh, – even the Razzes. All right. We got to get going, gang. Thank you to each and every one of you for joining us. Mile high salute to our Super Chat superstars and our Facebook supporters. Much love to you. Thank you. We're out of here. And tomorrow night we're off, but you'll have Nick and Carl of Building the Broncos with a fresh episode, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. So make sure you are tuned in for that. And then Zach and I will be back in the saddle Wednesday night. We're going to have Glenn Hauser on the show for, I believe it's the 12th. Chris Hernandez might uh, check me on this, but I think it's the 12th superstar segment. And we look forward to talking to Glenn. So make sure you do not miss that episode. Meantime, gang, make sure you are following the podcast on Twitter at huddle up pod. Make sure you're following at mile high huddle and my partner here, Zach Kelberman at Kelberman NFL myself at Chad and Jensen. And then also you got to follow our producer, John K M H H at John K MHH, but we got to get out of here for tonight. So, Zach, have a great start to your week, my friend. You too. 
14 days, Chad, and counting. And time, next time we podcast, it'll be 12 days to go until Broncos football. I, I literally am counting down the minutes. Amen. All right, gang. We got to get out of here. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll see you on Wednesday, but don't forget building the Broncos tomorrow night. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.